the contraband yeah 20 year anniversary re-releasing it on vinyl with a bunch of extra songs i remember tommy had just gotten the metallica black record it wasn't even out yet tommy had gotten a cassette of it he's like dudes I got the new Metallica record. And he puts it on and then Sad But True came on and he was just like, dude! And he just, you know, it started like, and he fell back in his chair and he fell on the ground and he like cranked it and he blew up the speakers and he had to pay like 10 grand to get the speakers fixed. The Ingve record came out. I just couldn't even understand it. I was like, what, how does he do that? What is this? And I remember I went to Paul Gilbert's apartment for like a private lesson. And I'm like, dude, you know, what is he doing? Like, what, what's going on here? Yeah. Do you think Steven Chirot's Stripper Girl could have been a hit? No. Hey everybody, it's Derek, a.k.a. Mr. Shred with Masters of Shred. We are here for another episode of Talking Shred. And today's guest... Here on the platform, I view this guy as a legend. I have seen him live back when I was a teenager. Blew my mind. Hard Rock Hotel, Hollywood, Florida. We're talking about the super group guru. One of the most versatile shred fiends in the business today. I'm talking about the criminally, tragically underrated, okay, Dave Kushner of Velvet Revolver, of Infectious Grooves, and maybe you know a little bit about Electric Love Hogs, which we just recently posted too. So give it up for the mighty Dave Kushner. Yes. First of all, thanks for having me. And uh, I love your your site. And, and I mean, you know, I love shredding. I grew up, you know, I, I didn't do a lot of it, of course, in Velvet Revolver because I was in a band with Slash. So there's not a lot of room. But, um, you know, he was my favorite guitar player in high school and you know still one of my favorites um and when i started playing you know i got to a point where i could move my fingers but i didn't really know where to put them you know and i i ended up going to music school going to mi in hollywood and dude i i when i was going there uh paul gilbert was a student like i was in first quarter and paul was in third quarter and steve i would come and and play and do like clinics and there was just so much shredding going on. <laughs> no, but there, there was so much of that, you know, and for me, it's like, I was super into that. You know, I would sit in a room and just practice scale patterns all day. And, and yeah, I remember the first Ingve record came out and I went to, I remember I had the album, you know, and I go to Paul Gilbert cause he was the only dude like, like, so Racer X used to practice in this, in this practice room at like eight in the morning. Right. And I would go to school early just to watch. It was him and John, the bass player. And it was before Bruce was in the band, but Bruce was also a student there. So it was just a three piece. It was John Aldretti, uh, uh, Paul Gilbert and this Italian dude that played drums. I think he might've played on the first Racer X record. And, they would practice, dude, and I would just sit in the room and watch, you know, because it was a performance room. And, you know, so I've always been super into it. And that the Ingve record came out and I and I just couldn't even understand it. You know, I, I was like, what? How does he do that? What is this? And I remember I uh, went to Paul Gilbert's apartment for like a private lesson. And I'm like, dude, how does he you know, what is he doing? Like, what, what's going on here? And I remember Paul like put the record on. And he listened to it once, like this one little shred part, you know, and then he, he was like, oh, wait. And he listened to it again. And he's like, oh, it's just Phrygian mode. It's E, it's A minor scale over E minor. I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, it's just this. I'm like, oh my God, dude. I was so like, just like blown away, like, you know. So anyways, back to contraband. Yeah, 20 year anniversary. I had no idea actually that they were gonna, uh, they're re-releasing re it on vinyl with a bunch of extra songs. I just found out. Wow. Uh, a bunch of like, not songs that we recorded for that, but just, you know, different little, you know, a live version of this or, you know, whatever. There's some extra stuff that's gonna be on there that they're 
I think it's they're releasing it in September. Wow. Okay, that's big news. Yeah, which was a total coincidence. Uh, you know, I started posting these videos just kind of for the hell of it, and then I found out that they were going to re-release the 20-year anniversary. Wow, good good timing then. I guess you didn't get that memo, though, about that, huh? <laughs> that's what I'm assuming, or... I didn't. <laughs> I didn't tell you that. I got it later. <laughs> no. I always get it, just not, you know. <laughs> got, it, got it. Well, you know what? I got to tell you. You can't go into a story like that you told previously about going to MI with Paul Gilbert, seeing these guys. You can't just leave it at that. I'm already freaking out. I'm geeking out over that story hardcore. So we we'll have to backtrack it just a tad bit and ask you more about that, all right? So you have to elaborate. I've heard stories that Paul Gilbert has also taught Buckethead at his apartment before. Did you ever run into Buckethead while being out there, seeing him as like a student? If I did, I wouldn't have known it because he no, didn't have right. the bucket. On. <laughs> right. like, you know, it's like I, I don't really know. I don't really know him very well. Uh, I I wouldn't even know what he looked like without the bucket. Um, without the bucket. Yeah, but um, I, I yeah. So I don't know. The the only people I remember from the school was, uh, like I know I I know other guys that went there actually. Like my buddy Scott that was in Weezer, that plays bass in Weezer, he went there. Rivers went there. But um, you also played with those guys too um, yeah, on Spike TV. TV. Yeah, I did. Right? Um, but I didn't go when they went. You know, I just I just know that they went. So I know uh, Jeff Buckley went there. You know, there's a bunch of, bunch of people that went there. Um, when I was going there, the only one, you know, that I remember really was all the Racer X guys, you know, John, uh, all those those guys I already mentioned. Even Bruce was going there, um, you know, and then there was like Steve Vai and guys like that would come and do clinics and stuff. But other than that, I don't really remember any super shredder, any guys of note like that that were there yeah. when I was there. Okay, well, I got to ask you this, and what would you say is the most valuable thing you learned while you went to the Musicians Institute? The thing you walked away with, you said, wow, that helped me tremendously throughout my career. Um, probably the scale patterns, you know, just and basic theory. Like I, yeah, I mean, really just that. Like knowing where to go, like the basics, uh, the foundation of, of theory and, you know, like I'm not the most, I'm definitely not the most, uh, you know, if you said playing, you know, A7-9 chord or what, A minor 9, you know, I, I could figure it out, you know, but I wouldn't just go like, oh yeah, it's this, I'll go play this and this is the inversion of that. And, you know, like I know what all that stuff is and, and. It's like reading music, you know, you don't, unless you are constantly do it, it, you kind of forget about it. So, mm -hmm. um, but really those scale patterns and knowing like the basics of, you know, oh, I can play anywhere on the fretboard in a minor, I can, in a minor, you know, or the relative major to, you know, G major relative minor is E minor. So I know like that, or you know, just those very basic things uh, definitely carried on for that, you know, I still use today. Well, you know, we got to talk about that because if you listen to some of your stuff, and I, I just recently, and I'm, I'm sad to even say this, got introduced for the first time to Electric Love Hogs. I got the, I, I literally, I can't say I purchased it because now you're going streaming. So I'm streaming it off of Apple Music. I find the album. And I go, this is, oh my gosh, this is the funkiest, heaviest, you know, collaboration of just what will become really all-star players, right? I mean, you guys, you went on to do what you did. I mean, your drummer went on to do what he did. It was incredible. But I went back and I watched them, like, the musicianship. You can tell you studied. You had to have because just, again, that level of your playing. When I, I, I just listened to that album, the whole album from front to back, and I go, whoa, this is, like, mind-blowing guitar work here. You're just slaying it. So... I could definitely hear some of that stuff, but let's talk about that. Because not a lot of people know that album was actually tied with Tommy Lee, right? Yeah. 
Um, what happened was, so the Love Hogs were a local LA band. And, and, you know, it was a great time. It was like we would play shows with Mighty Joe Young that became, you know, Stone Temple Pilots and Rage Against the Machine and, and Tool and all these bands were coming up at the same time. You know, we'd all play gigs together at these tiny clubs and Jane's Addiction was like right before us. And, and you know, it was a great time to just be in that band. And, and we, we were all friends and knew each other locally in Hollywood. And then we, um, so the band, uh, Tommy Lee was looking for a band to produce. And the someone from Geffen brought him to one of our shows and then we sat down with them afterwards and... He was like, dude, I love this band. Like, I want to produce you guys. Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then we ended up getting signed, not with Geffen, but with Polygram. And we did that that um, that um record. And he ended up, you know, not doing the whole thing. But we, we had Mark Dodson that had done, um, that did the Infectious. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's just such a big thing. Like, the, the studio we were recording you know, so we're going to do it with Mark Dodson and with Tommy Lee. And Mark Dodson was also doing the first Infectious Grooves record at the same studio. And they were also doing No More Tears at the same studio. This studio, Devonshire, that doesn't exist anymore. Wow. So we were all like in the same kind of common area hanging out. And, um, and I had known uh, the guys from Infectious... You know, and so we did our first record, but it, it was, I mean, it was awesome. Like, it was such a great time, you know, like what I remember Tommy had just gotten um, the Metallica Black record had just come. It wasn't even out yet, but because Bob Rock had produced, you know, Dr. Feelgood and he had, you know, produced a black record, Tommy had gotten a cassette of it. And he came to the studio. He's like, "Dudes, I got the new, I got the new Metallica record, like you know, on a cassette." He's like, "Dudes, we gotta check it out." And he like, you know, we're sitting in the in the you know the, not the tracking room, but the the control room, and we just and he puts it on, and it's like, you know, first it's, um, excuse me, it's you know, Enter Sandman. He's like, "Oh, oh you were just you know hearing it in in, you know this." with these huge speakers and everything. And then he put on, and then Sad But True came on, and he was just like, dude! And he just, you know, it started like, and he fell back in his chair, and he fell on the ground, and he like cranked it, and he blew up the speakers, and I think he had to pay like 10 grand to get the speakers fixed, and it was super fun, man. And and uh, he was great. Like, he was so into, you know, he's super musical, he's super into funk, and, and doing cool stuff, and, he sang backups and he's a good singer. So he would do like cool harmonies and stuff. And wow. Did a little percussion here and there, but he was a, he was a good producer. Like he really knew sonically, you know, what he wanted to hear and how to kind of put it all together. So no, now, it was a great did, experience. I got to ask you, did you do all the guitar solos in that album? Cause I know there was another guitar no. player in the band. No, Donnie, uh, Donnie Campion, the other guitar player, we, we split it all pretty even. You know, okay. um, yeah, you can kind of tell, oh, well, I can tell obviously, but the styles are a little different, but, um, mostly, yeah, we split everything. Did, uh, did you do the full solo in Tribal Monkey? Cause I actually got that on Masters of Shred and there was a part in there towards the end where I couldn't tell if maybe he hopped in and did that outro no, of that main that. solo. That's all you. Okay, yeah, okay. cool. I couldn't tell because I know, I know it's an incredible solo. I just found that video. And it's the only video I could find, official music video for yeah. that. And I'm like, this is great, dude. And you see people are commenting. I'm like, I saw those guys live so many times. And uh, some guy actually responded and said, man, I didn't appreciate it much, much at 16. But now at like 48, damn, I appreciate it so much more. So great, you know? Yeah, I appreciate yeah. the hair. <laughs> So, okay, what happened there? Because there you had short hair, right? So you started out with long hair. I saw like a video with you and Tommy Lee and the rest of the band talking about the album being made inside the music studio. You had long hair, and I almost didn't recognize you. And yeah. then in that video, it went a little shorter, right? I had your haircut. You had your did. It, it looked good, dude. It looked great on you. 
you know? And then and then you you it all went away yeah, and it went to more of the uh, beanie look. Oh, it fell out. Yeah. Okay. That's that's fine. That's not a big deal. You know, it's it's just dude, it, it's like the 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 comb over of the new millennium. You know, it's yeah. like it it just did happen. You know, it yeah. got started yeah. getting thin and you just you know, it's better just shave it. You know. Well, it is true, dude. I have a nice you know head, what? so I'm I'm very lucky. You you are because not everybody looks good bald. True, it's, it's true. true. So the the Rock is lucky, and so is Stone Cold Steve Austin and Bill Goldberg. But yeah. uh, you know, and, Dude, and of course and, you. And I'll tell you that the story of the mustache is because the guys like that. Like I, I remember when I shaved my head, and then I had a goatee, and then I looked like all those guys. You know, what I mean, like we all like every bald guy with a goatee, and I really, I just like shaved out the middle one day and i was like oh that's kind of cool and it's that's how it came to be signature look you know what's funny about that i'll tell you something dude you go back and you watch any the revolver live concert footage you go watch any music video and you take away the date that that took place the, when that music video was dropped and you look at the styles how all of you looked it's timeless if you look at it today it still looks relevant and it's not passe that says a lot. Like, everyone had their own style, and it's still relevant today. It does not look dated. Yeah, I remember, uh, <laughs> but I remember, like, in the beginning trying to kind of find, like, you know, just like, oh, how should I, should I try and do something different? Like, there's this one, um, um, uh, what is it, Guitar World, like, the first cover we did a Guitar World. I'm wearing like this fedora and like this long coat and a white beater. And it's just like, my, I'm just, my whole look is so untogether. And I remember, and then like, there was this other photo shoot where I was like, I had this like Vivian Westwood suit that my wife had found. It was like this cool double breasted, like brown suit or whatever. And it was funny though. Cause like Scott, you know, with being Scott was like, dude, what's your look? Like, we gotta, like, maybe you should be the guy that's like this, that, like, you know, and he was super into, like, molding me into, you know, like, he got all excited because he was like, what do you think of a, and I'm like, oh, dude, you know, I think I'm just gonna wear this, and he's like, no, no, maybe you should be, like, like, the suit guy, but, like, the, the guy with the thing and, the, like, a wife beater, but, like, a suit, and that could be, like, your look, and I was like, oh, okay, guy. You know, you get all excited about that kind of stuff. Well, you know, if you're gonna bring up Scott Wyland like that in in his in his fashion sense, I gotta ask you. Around that time, he teamed up with, I believe, English Laundry, and they did the Scott Wyland collection. Remember those shirts? Yeah, dude, that, those that are... happened on tour. I remember that. You do? Yeah, fully. Dude, those shirts were great. I remember when they came out. I would have a whole closet full of them. I'm like, they have the best style, and Scott Wyland is a part of it. Which yeah. I was a fan of the band anyway. It's like, but, you know, these days you don't see those shirts, but I'm sure after this drops, you may see people trying to scout them at, like, vintage stores and see the price go up. And they really weren't, you know, that expensive back then, but they look good. Yeah. I like your shirt, yeah. actually. Oh, thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a little um, tribute to the Scott Weiland collection. But, um... Oh, really? It's really nice. <laughs> no, Thanks, I like man. It. I, like a, I like a nice, like, short sleeve casual shirt. You can go to the beach. You can go, like, wear it with yes, shorts. Yes. Long sleeve is too much. I can't do long sleeve. Summer's here. Not going to work, dude. How do you pay tribute to one of the greatest guitarists from one of the greatest rock bands of all time? In collaboration with the mighty Sam Hill Customs, Masters of Shred proudly brings to you the limited edition Super Halen 1x12 stack. Each cabinet is scientifically crafted with the highest grade materials to give you that monstrous tone that will light up the sky. Hand signed and dated by Sam Hill himself, these limited edition amps are limited to just 50 pieces. With no two finishes being the same, you can be assured that your Super Halen amp is one of a kind. Visit www.mastersofshred.com now to reserve yours today before you can't get this stuff no more. Let's talk yeah. about the gear a little bit. Were you rocking yeah. ESPs with electric love hogs? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I, I was. Uh, I got a story for everything. Um, I liked the B 
because the um, ESPs felt like Charvels, you know, like the neck. You could, you know, they had that like unfinished flat, you know, fretboard and everything, which obviously lends itself to shredding and, and good size frets, you know. And they were really cool back then. And um, our manager, uh, Rick, God, I can't even remember his name. Our manager was Slayer's manager at the time. And he had a, he, you know, had a relationship because those guys had a relationship with ESP. And I was like, yeah, dude, hook me up. You know, I'm, I'm totally down. And, um, and they were great, you know, and they, they, um, they made me two of those guitars, the blue one that I smashed in the video and they got pissed. Cause I, cause I, you know, I was young. I was like 21 or something, 22. And I was just like, and I, I didn't think about it. I just started smashing the guitar in the video. And that was like an actual, like my main guitar. And I had a black <laughs> one too. And then at the end, I took it back, like thinking like, oh, just replace the neck, you know, but I had smashed it so hard that the, the, the cavity where the, the neck sits in was all messed up too. And they were like, well, you know, we're going to have to make a new one now, blah, blah, blah. And you, you, you tell us you're going to smash it. And they were all bummed out. But I love those ESP guitars. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, that's funny, man. ESP were, I mean, before they became like the ESP, everybody knows them for their guitars. They were really making everyone else's guitars. All yeah. Kramer's bodies and necks were coming from ESP, you know? Yeah. So you had that, and I believe, uh, who was the other one? Um, they were giving, uh, there was a company called Bear, oh gosh, it's called Fox, was the subsidiary of Bar not Barrington, Barrington, Barrington. I don't know if you've ever heard about Barrington Guitars. Super Shredder, some had telly bodies, big reverse banana headstocks made in Chicago. They are worth a small fortune today if you find them. They're one of the elite Shredder guitars. Dude, all made by ESP. Yeah. It's crazy. So ESP was, you know, they still are killing it. I was just going to bring this up to you since you were going... The musicians performance guitars? Yes, dude. I have a performance guitar I scored in Orlando that you would freak you out really? over. Dude, I'm a Facebook Marketplace fanatic, so I'll go on there late at night just bored going through the listings. Yeah. I find a guy – I'm going to name places. Titusville, okay? okay. And he, I see a Lamborghini Orange, one humbucker, Kaler, banana head stock like an 85 Kramer, wow. maple neck, okay? Nice. $600. He listed really? as performance guitar. Yeah. So he, I, I said, oh, wait, is this, is this the performance that like Dweezil, Steve I, all those guys? Yeah, yeah. Got it for 350 That's in the awesome, story. Dude. I wanted to get that lime green, uh, you know, that Steve I Charvel that he has, the lime green with the pink pickups. And you had a drummer from your first band, Wasted Youth, which was Joey Castillo, right? Okay. Any relationship to randy castillo no good you know what we're gonna we're actually breaking that now for the first time because people all over threads online have been asking that for years okay no, really. i was yeah i was actually wondering that too i'm like is he related to randy castillo who's also a drummer what are the odds right it's confirmed he is not okay, okay he is but not. you guys did go off to start a band whose name is very familiar but not the one we're thinking of you guys were the original lit uh, yeah, that was, that's true. I'm trying to remember if Joey, yeah, it was, uh, me and, so Kelly, the bass player from, um, from the Love Hogs, who's now play, who, who now plays in Buck Cherry, um, he and I quit the band. He and I quit the Love Hogs. And then we started like, you know, our own thing. And then Joey was playing drums for a minute, but it went, wait, was that? I don't know, dude. I can't, I don't know if that was the same <laughs> band. I know that lit, wait, was that lit or was that? Yeah, I think lit went through like a lot of different iterations. It was like me and like those guys. And then later it was me and Bobby from the Love Hogs who would play Norgy. Actually, it was there was uh, Amir, Amir Durak was in it. Uh, that I think when we sold the name, 
the the last version of the band was me, Amir, uh, Jay, the singer from Orgy was playing bass, and we had this dude Eric from New York, and me, and that was that was lit. And then we tried to you know get a record deal, and we didn't, and then the band just kind of died, and then. I was working at MTV and someone called me like randomly, dude. One day I was at work and some dude was like, Hey, I'm, I'm in this band. And we were called, I forget what they were, the, whatever their name was, was the, the name of their first record that band lit. And the guy's like, yeah, we, we, you know, we got this and we can't name it that because of this, and we were going to name it lit, but we heard that you had the name and, I was like, oh, yeah, it's, you know, but the band's dead. And they're like, all right, well, can we use the name? And I said, yeah, I don't care. And they're like, all right, well, we're going to give you a hundred bucks and, you know, have you sign this thing that says you won't come and sue us for the name. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Let me ask you, when you saw them break through, right, with My Own Worst Enemy, did you ever say to yourself, shit, she got more than a hundred for that name? I mean, honestly, I don't really think that way. But okay, I know good, a lot good. of people around me do, you know, I just was, I act, dude, I actually, so in between bands, I would always work building sets for, for music videos and TV and film stuff. And that was like my day job, like doing art department on music videos. And I actually worked on that video. Like I worked on the lit video doing props or something I worked on so many, like I worked on an SCP video. No kidding. I worked on so many music videos that there was this, there was this um, assistant director. His name was Joe, and so and I used to work with him, and he was the best. He, the, Joe Osborne, and he was like the nicest, most awesome guy, and he was always the the first AD, and I worked on all these music videos, and then years later. I was doing the Velvet Revolver, the Slither video, and Joe was the the AD, and he's like, yo, dude, what are you doing here? I'm like, dude, I'm in the band. And he's like, what? No way. He's like, give me hugs. And, sh and then years after that, my son was in a, a Maroon 5 video, the one they did with SZA, you know, that, that okay. song? Um, I forget the name of the song. But... The video starts with, uh, like, Adam Levine is a little kid and SZA is a little kid. And they're, like, running through a field and stuff. And that's my son. And and Joe was at that video, too. He's like, yo, what are you doing here? I'm like, dude, that's my kid. <laughs> so funny. And then Joe's kid was working with him. He's like, no, oh, that's my kid. That's my band. That's my kid. <laughs> yeah, I got sidetracked. Sorry. That's awesome, though. That's great. Keep what so you want. I gotta ask you, what was the craziest music video you worked on the set of? Uh, I remember we worked on a music video for that band, The Flies. They were kind of like lit-ish type of band like around that time, and they had this video where they were. We did it down in Palos Verdes, where Marineland, this old like kind of like Sea World, but like a really small Sea World. Thing they had in in Palos Verdes, and they there was this cliff, and we had to build these ramps, like these steel deck ramps on this cliff, and it was like, here's the cliff, and then the ramp was like this, and then there was like a little bit of of ground here, so they would show like these kids like jumping off, and the camera was here, so it looked like they were jumping off this cliff, but really they were just jumping off and landing on this little piece of land before the cliff. I worked on that Brandy Monica video. Um, that was a cool video. I don't know. I worked on a bunch of videos. That's so wild. So you, you've been in the industry lock and loaded for decades. Yeah. Oh, Sour Girl. That was a cool. The Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yeah, we built that whole, like, little, you know, land that they're in front of with the where the Teletubby-looking characters were, like, that whole backdrop thing, like, like, I remember working on that video and, like, seeing, you know, Scott and Robert come in. They're like, dude, what's up? What are you doing? I'm like, I built that thing you're standing on. They're like, well, it's red. 
yeah. so you knew you 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 okay so you had already known scott at that point before you even got into velvet revolver you guys had met before right oh yeah dude we like i said we when i was in the love Ogs, uh we would play shows together and and when they were still mighty joe young when they got the deal and everything then they changed their name to sdp but they were called Mighty Joe Young at first. And they were, like, if you listen to the Love Hogs record, it's kind of Faith No More-ish, kind of funk metal, whatever, kind of conglomeration of styles. And Mighty Joe Young was a little more Chili, chili Pepper-ish than STP, you know, became. So they were definitely more, a little funkier, you know, back then. But yeah, I mean, we we were friends. Like, we were friendly and, and would you know, bullshit and see each other at clubs and play shows together. So wow. We, yeah, I mean, I definitely knew him longer than anyone in the band. Wow, no kidding. He got in the band. Now, now, right before right before you got in Velvet Revolver, you were in Japan with an up-and-coming band. Um, well, now, help me if I'm pronouncing this wrong. Was it called Zilch? Yes, it was. Okay. And, and were you living in Japan at that point? No, I was, you know, it goes back to Joey Castillo. Like, we were in Wasted Youth together before the Love Hogs. Uh, we did the first iteration of Lit together. I ended up playing in Danzig because Joey was in Danzig, and he got me that audition. I played in this band, Sugar Tooth, that Joey was in, and uh, and then he was doing Zilch, and he suggested me and then I came in and then we went on tour and did like three weeks, I think in Japan. It's a really long story, dude. It's probably not like, it's like a whole podcast. Okay. Well, I got to ask you this then. If that's the case, I, when I read about that, I heard about that. I said, is that where he got introduced to Fernandez guitars? You know, believe it or not, I was already endorsed by Fernandez at that point. And it was, through this guy, Scott Uchida, that used to work at Dunlop also, but he and I think the guy that now works at Arcane that makes those pickups, uh, Rob, they were all like Fernandez guys back in the day, and they were like trying to, you know, get the word out, and they would, and I remember like, like in Sugar Tooth, I had, you know, one of those Fernandez um, tellies, and so they were trying to do that, and, and they knew... Bobby at Mates and it was all kind of in the same, you know, rehearsal studios where everyone rehearsed and and so um yeah, it was just a coincidence. And the guy who the guy who recorded the Zilch rec- record was this guy from ex Japan named Hide and Hide had passed away and then I kind of I don't want to say I replaced him, but I was, you know, playing all his parts and everything. But he was the biggest Fernandez and Dorsey ever. In wow. the history of and when like when he died, I think they sold like I think it was like thirty thousand signature models the day he died. Like like Michael Jackson of guitar players of Japan. Like, Isn't that crazy? And we would hear nothing about him here, essentially. Yeah, I've never Dude, my I remember when he died, my uncle and I was telling my uncle, like, Oh, I'm going to Japan and it's this guy Hide and I had never heard of him. And and my uncle was like, who's like a librarian at some college. And he was like, I just saw his funeral on CNN. Like, that's how big he was. Like, it it was like crazy. Wow, wow. And you, so you've been a Fernandez artist forever. So how do you feel about the unfortunate news recently that they're going to officially close their doors? Which, I mean, Fernandez is like an iconic Japanese guitar brand. I mean... Have you heard? What was the last time you heard from like anyone over there? It has it been recent or? No, it's been forever. I mean, to be honest, like, you know, my my experience with Fernand is like they were great. It was always super good relationship, but then they kind of changed hands, and uh, during the first uh, Velvet Revolver cycle, like I had I had all those guitars, and then eventually, you know, like I had my model right there, and. It was great, and then I wanted to do another model. Like when when I did this one, I 
like I went to some hot rod shop and got like that paint and I was like this is the paint I want you know I want it to look like this and I really was like I want the binding to be this and I want you know blah 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 and then I did the blue one and I remember like I I said I want it to be exactly the same but blue I want the cream binding I want blah 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 and then they you know I remember like going to see the prototype and there and it had black binding and I was like no, I, I said, like, I wanted this, this, and this. And they're like, whoa. And I was dealing with different guys now. And I'm like, you know, it was like, it just bummed me out. Because it was like, they, they changed the design. And then I, I was like, well, I don't want this. And they're like, well, we already kind of started producing it. And I remember playing it. And I was like, this doesn't play as good as the other one. And they're like, I'm like, what's, this is not right. And they're like, oh, well, we switched, you know, uh, manufacturers from like Korea to, to China or vice versa or whatever. And I was like, dude, the, I'm, I'm, I'm not putting my name on this. Like, I, I don't want to really do this. And they're like, Oh, well, we'll fix it. And then they fixed it. But from that point on, it really kind of soured me on the, not the brand, like the guitars are fine, but like, you know, the, just dealing with them as a company at that point. Yeah. So, that's when like the second album you know happened and then brendan turned me on to those gibson 345s and then um you know slash was obviously with gibson and i met some right. dudes there and they were like check this guitar and they gave me that guitar you know and wow. i was like oh this is well i was like you know this is my new guitar and, and uh so I, you know it just so it, it just made more sense it was just natural to go to gibson yeah. Did Slash ever fiddle with your signature Fernandez? When you were on the road? No. He wouldn't touch it. No. No, <laughs> really? he, it's not, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> he wouldn't he would not touch, you know, he just was like, "Oh, that's cool." And you know, I think that the, you know, those guys were so um you know, they had such rich histories with Gibson and Fender. You know, and then when I I'm like this new guy, and I come along with this like weird looking guitar by some you know brand that no one's ever heard of, and you know I'm like, hey guys, check out my guitar, you know, and they're like, oh that's nice, you know, <laughs> got to I right, go along, go play it over there. They weren't that dismissive, but you know what I mean. It was kind of like they had, and now you know I, I really see the difference. Like when I pick up my guitar, you know my signature model versus um, you know this Les Paul that I have that's like a an Eric Clapton signature model it's like you know I mean you feel the difference and you hear the yeah. difference so it's true. you know it, it is true I had a Fernandez that was one of their Strat copies that had the um, the ball headstock like Brad Gillis's did back in the day and it was a gorgeous guitar I actually just sold it gorgeous look great but it you know, when you pull out your like Gibsons and stuff like that, it's just, you're right. It's just different quality. It's a different kind of feel. You know, great guitars though. I mean, the ones I had were all made in Japan, but like you're saying, they did do a shift, and I think it was to Korea, and that's when you started to see the uh, craftsmanship kind of change a bit. Yeah. And I think that may have been the case with what happened to yours. I'm not saying Korean made guitars are bad because now the standards are like crazy good. I mean, look at all the Paul Reed Smiths. They're nuts for being the SE yeah. models, right? I think those may be made in like Indonesia. I think I'm not sure. I'm sure I'm gonna get fact checked on that. But imports aren't all bad. No, I but, no, um, I, I agree. You know, I mean, like, look, they they're, you know, it's like I don't know if you've ever been to Japan, but like their attention to detail is is crazy. Like, you know, it's next level. You know, so you know to to have something made from there, you know, it's not like I don't. I, I, but having been there many times. I never like dismiss the quality of something just because it's from, you know, here or there. Like I remember when, when I had that problem with Fernandez, they, this actual, this one guitar. You see that? Like there's a little white sticker right here, and it's yeah. actually written in Japanese because they, because I was like, you know what? I'm done. I'm I'm leaving. And they were like, no, no, no. Wait, we'll make you. What if we make your guitars in Japan? You know, and I was like, well, maybe, I don't know. And then they made this one in Japan, like one, like a one-off. You know what's funny though? Your guitar still holds value really well. Oh. And 
Yeah, it's it's my dad has a blue one. He has the I think they called it Pelham blue. Yeah, yeah, and that's it has the one, but it's got black binding, and it's like not what I wanted. Well, you know what? I got I don't remember if his was Korean or Japanese. It has this, the uh, sustainer though, which is what. Listen, that's what everybody wants when they buy a Fernandez. They want that sustainer in the neck, you know. Sure. And those are a little harder to come by. But uh, yeah, I know because they just announced they're finally done, and I just think, man. Yeah, that's the end of a Japanese icon for guitars because they were killing it. I think in the '80s they had they had Jakey e. Lee. I mean, they had you. They had Brad Gillis, Adrian yeah. Vandenberg, uh, Kurt Hammett was playing them. Yeah, Robert Trujillo had his mom. Robert Trujillo, there you go. I found an yeah. ad, dude. I found an ad recently. Uh, it's just me and Robert, you know, in a Fernandez ad. What? Yeah. It's really? Cool. Yeah. You're you're gonna have to send me that because. I love that stuff. If you look behind me right here, that's literally a magazine rack I bought with all old 80s guitar magazines on it. So I got guitar school, guitar for the practicing musician, old guitar player. I got them all, dude, because I love the ads. They just yeah. like so – it's, it's such a different time. You can you can feel and sense the enthusiasm for guitar. Everyone was like exploring all these new dynamics and shit. Yeah. And yeah, we have great players today, but I just think the enthusiasm that you guys experienced back then for guitar playing – isn't there today? Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't see it to the degree. Yeah, yeah. You know what it's I mean? Definitely different. Yeah, and especially it's... that, like, if you were gonna be in an, like, I remember in, you know, like in Velvet Revolver when I started getting like ads and stuff, and it was like, oh, they're gonna, like, I did a Dunlop string ad or I did a Roto Sound ad, and I was just like, whoa, you know, it's like you wait, you like, look, you open the magazine, you're just like, whoa, like I have all, I same thing, I have all those magazines in in my in my garage like you know all the like the guitar magazine that me and slash are on the cover of i forget if it was guitar world or i don't know what it was but, maybe guitar one i remember guitar one was doing a lot of love for belt revolver back which they're they're also gone now too yeah. the more guitar one magazine a lot of defunct ones but definitely a good time to be alive now before we get into the revolver you actually yeah. knew slash in high school junior high right yeah, yeah, we went to uh, junior high and high school together. He was one grade no. ahead of me, but yeah. Okay, so do you guys ever hang out and like jam together at any point, or was it more so I just knew of him in school, he knew of me? We didn't and... jam, but we were, you know, we were friends. Like, we didn't hang out a lot, but we definitely hung out in the same circles at times. Um, I remember he had this three-piece band called Titus Sloan, and I remember one time going to his apartment what well, you know where he lived with his mom and his brother and trying to sing but like i i can't sing really but i had sang in this punk rock band so i was like oh maybe i could sing you know and i remember like trying to sing with him it was just me and him in his room or in the living room of the apartment it was bad really no kidding well okay i know slash the big bmx guy did yeah. were, were you also a bmx kid in the 80s? i was a i rode skateboards but like we would, um, there was a school right by Fairfax that we, like the, the kids that were into skateboarding and BMX would all hop the fence to this one school because they had banks, you know, like, and uh, so it was like me and Slash and, and a handful of other people would all, you know, go over the fence and then ride skateboards and do bike stuff and. Yeah, it's so wild. I'm I'm a, I'm big into collecting. I'm getting into it now, but like the old BMX stuff. Like I I built a I don't yeah. know if you ever heard of the brand called Thruster, back in the late 70s. Yeah. Okay. So I have a I have a Timmy Judge signature model Thruster, which oh, he was nice. like a big dirt BMX rider. So I'm like rebuilding the whole thing. Cause I bought when I was a kid. I got the frame, which was yeah. back then all the money in the world to me because yeah, yeah. even in like the early 2000s, the things were rare. So. Just like seeing NASA up and then all the 80s skateboarding. So I'm sure you were maybe rocking vision boards? No, I had, well, it's, no, I had the first like real deck I ever bought. And I was telling this to, oh, cause I went on tour with Suicidal. I mean, with, uh, with Infectious and, and, uh, Jim Muir was there, right? Like hanging out, Mike's brother. And I was like, dude, he started Dogtown. And I was such a yeah. huge Dogtown fan. And I was, I told him I was like, dude, the first board, the first deck I ever bought was a was a nine inch Jim Muir Dogtown board, like at 
I forget the. It's not. It wasn't Rip City. It was this other skate shop in L.A. and and uh, yeah, that was the first board. And then I was super into the Dwayne Peters Santa Cruz boards. Let's just hop right into something. Okay. And I'm trying to hold off to go into. We gotta go into Velvet Revolver. We gotta talk about 20 year, not the 30 year anniversary. It's a 20 year anniversary. Yeah, 20. Yep. But, you know, but uh, let's go into that. So if I'm right on this, it was Duff that got you in to the band because he had met you in Japan when you were with Zilch. Yes. Is that right? Yep. Okay. So now you're in the band and Contraband blows up number one Billboard 200. Yeah. You guys get a Grammy. Yeah. Right? So this was, I mean, I, I remember that scene vividly well because I remember Godsmack was also on the charts, like top 10 killing it. And I would hear Slither and Godsmack songs on the radio. But back when there was rock radio, people listened to you, right? right. Crazy time to be alive. Um, but it was it was a blast. Now, you guys also did um, a thing for VH1. It was a special called Inside Out. Yeah. The Rise of Bell Revolver. Yeah, yeah. And Finding a Lead Singer. Right. I've watched that probably a dozen times. And the yeah. best part to me are all the crazy submissions you guys got. And looking at your reaction yeah, yeah. Yeah. as you watch totally. these guys that send in this video to be Dude, the lead singer. We were just like, you know, like, it was, yeah, it was crazy. So, I mean, I got to ask you, yeah. do you think that Stephen Chirot's Stripper Girl could have been a hit? No. No. But they, that guy was a good singer, you know? It's like he was... He, I, we were hopeful with him, you know, because he was, he's got a, he's got a good voice, you know, it's not Scott's voice and it's not the vibe obviously that it became, but you know, at the time he was like, you know, he's a good looking guy. He's got, he's a good singer. And, and, but then, you know, when he came back with that, it was just like, uh, no. Well, he was in kick Tracy too, right? Yeah. 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 So that's even earlier. But, yeah, I heard his voice. I'm like, he's got a good voice. But I, I go back to that part because just the scene from the episode where, like, literally Matt's like, are you, are you serious? And then you see Slash get up. He looks, like, angry <laughs> to shut it off immediately. Dude, because like, we had been doing that for 10 months. Like, we, we just th – those guys happened to come because Slash knew him, uh, the two guys that recorded the documentary – uh, they were both named Alex. The Alexes came and they would hang out and they're like, we, you know, we didn't really know what it was going to become. We didn't know it was going to take as long as it did. We didn't know obviously that Scott was going to be in the band. And I feel very fortunate to have that, you know, part of my life documented that way because it was so great that they, you know, they were there for all the, the whole ride. I mean, you saw, and they just happened to be there when Scott came and all that stuff happened. And, and it's great, you know, and, but yeah, it was really, I mean, you saw like even in there where, where, uh, Duff and Matt get in a fight because it was just like, so, you know, after a while, it's just like, I mean, we were there five days a week, Monday through Friday from two to six every week for 10 months. I think we took a break once for a week or two, but, and we wrote just songs every day. We wrote songs. We sat, we listened to submissions, we tried people out. We did that for 10 months. That's got to be so draining. So I have to ask you, do you think that with the advent of social media, where you can instantly scroll through and find singers, do you think that if this was now and you're looking for a singer, it would have been easier or maybe more overwhelming just due to how much is being thrown at you through social media now? What's your view on that? I think it would have definitely been easier. Because I mean, the just the the process was, you know, it was two thousand two. Like MP threes were just kind of starting, and you know, like literally the McBob uh, Duff's bass tech and my tech on the road would come with a with a box, you know, like those those uh, post office boxes, like full of submissions and we like you saw you know we'd have to sit there and literally like one guy would open it one guy would hand the cd and then the other guy would read the bio and it was like and and that took hours 
you know so it's like one day some days we wouldn't play and we would literally just sit there for three hours and go through these things you know and it's like we could have saved weeks months, you know like so much time just going like okay no 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 yes maybe right. let's email that guy you know but it was so much it was such a, a arduous process Right. Well, let me ask you, is there anything looking back now, I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. anything looking back on your time with Velvet Revolver that you would have done differently? Hmm. I don't, not that comes to mind. No. So I mean, overall, it, really it was the, everything you would have hoped for. for. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's, you have to realize that when you're in these situations, you're, you know, what I, and look, I came from, I was like the unknown guy, you know, it was like these guys that all had, you know, huge success before me. And I was just the guy that happened to be in the, you know, look, I'm not going to discredit the fact that I can play or that I, you know, added what I added, but I was also kind of just everything, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, someone up there's plan and you know or just luck or whatever destiny i don't know but you know the fact is is that what i learned from it is you know you've got five guys that are drawn together by uh art you know something creative but yet you are then you become five heads of a multi-million dollar company. And only Duff at the time had gone, Duff actually had gone back to school for finance. So he actually knew, you know, what he was talking about. But the rest of us were just kind of like, you know, all of a sudden, I mean, that's really, that's it. It's like, you have this company of creatives that, you know, are heads of this, multi-million dollar company but none of you are trained to be you know heads of a multi-million dollar company you're musicians guys that you know want to make something creative but then you know the the dichotomy of that is is very polarizing you know so and and people i think don't often think of it like that so those things can very much you know when you add drugs and alcohol into the equation and egos and all the other things that come, you know, that, that happened during that time, they, like I said, are polarizing and they just pull things in very different directions. Right. Right. Well, let me ask you this. What was the, what was, what was, what was if you just, you know, if you were to bring it down, narrow it down to one track, what was your favorite track to play live off of contraband? Someone asked me this the other day. Uh, I would say, you know, I don't really know. Sucker Train Blues was always super fun because we opened with it and it was, it had like, you know, tons of energy and you didn't want to like break stuff. And so that I think was probably that. That's a great track. And when you guys did um, Set Me Free and it was on the Hulk soundtrack, did you, were you guys ever invited to the premiere party for that? Oh yeah, that was like a whole. That was a whole thing. Like we, we, uh, we met with all these different. They're uh, they're all in the video, you know. Like the I saw that. Saw, yeah. Like all those uh, music supervisors from Paramount and all the, you know, and and uh, we ended up talking with the different ones and getting offered different movies, and then we got the Hulk. But when we got offered the Hulk, it was very like we were very involved. Like, uh, we actually went to, uh, Kathy, Kathy Griffin. No, not Kathy Griffin. Kathy. I can't remember her name. She was the music supervisor. And she's like, we, I want you to come to my house and Ang Lee, the director is going to be there and they want to kind of talk. And maybe there's a way to maybe tweak, you know, uh, the lyrics a little bit for, because he wants to explain to you what the deal is with his version of the Hulk. 
So we actually met with him and him and Scott talked about the lyrics and, you know, they're like, we don't want to take it away from what you've already done, but maybe there's like a little tweak here or there that we could do that may have it make more sense with the Hulk's journey. And, you know, like, so we, we did all that and then we went to the premiere and, uh, yeah, I remember go, I have a picture of me and my wife and Stan Lee, you know, and uh, because he was there and I remember meeting um, like Danny Elfman and and his brother. And yeah, it was pretty it was pretty cool. It's going to be a wild ride. Oh, just a wild couple of years for you. Right. In there where you're all this being thrown at you. Right. But you no one can deny you've paid your dues in every sense of the term. You know, so I'm like that. I think you were exactly where you needed to be, you know, yeah. and I don't I don't think anybody else could have taken that that job, you know. So that, that's that's really awesome to hear about that. Now, you know, with Velvet Revolver and the big success, second album comes around and then we see the breakup. And, and you know, I think that um, Scott went on to do Stone Temple Pilots again for a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah. And he then, went back to SCP. Right. And then you around 2008. You reinvent yourself in a way, right? Through TV. You enter the TV world with movie and television soundtracks. Tell yes. us about that. I mean, really, it's just... Um, the I was... So, I just had my, my son, you know, my first kid in 2008. And the band was kind of done. And I was... I mean, honestly, dude, I, again, I really just, I don't know if it's destiny or whatever. I, I, I got really lucky or whatever. I, I was at, I was with Scott from Weezer and Brian Ray from um, Paul McCartney's band and this other friend of ours, Bob Thiel, who was the composer and music supervisor on Sons of Anarchy and um, the Mayans and we were all sitting in this booth in Johnny Rockets and we were just talking and he was telling us about this job he had just gotten. He's like, Oh, I'm doing the music for the show. And it's like the Sopranos meets the hell's angels. And it's going to be called sons of anarchy. And they hadn't started filming or anything yet. And he's like, you know, and just here's the vibe. And I'm thinking like this and you guys have any ideas. And I was like, Oh, man, it'd be cool if you did this and blah, blah, blah. And he said, you know, do you have any idea? He's like, if you want to come by and work on something or write something. And, you know, th th for me, it also, like, on a in a very non-musical way, is a big uh, moment for me to really remember and see um, contrary action being a, such a positive thing in my life. Like, I said, I, my my wiring is to say no, you know, out of fear, like, you know, oh, no, 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 I'm busy. You know, it's like, no, if I get in a room with you, you're going to find out that I'm not as good as you think I am or whatever, you know, like that kind of imposter syndrome and all those kind of things. And so my head told me to say no. And so I said yes, you know, because I've been I've learned to just take contrary action. And I said yes. And I went over to his house a week later and I had that riff. Um, because I, I, I had that riff anyways. And so I was like, well, dude, I got this part and it kind of sounds like it might be cool. And the brand and, and, and we wrote it into a song like that day. Like we wrote the whole song that day. We, he, we sang, he sang on it. We, um, he wasn't the final singer, but like he sang the melody. We wrote the melody together. We wrote the lyrics. We played everything and recorded it that day. Wow. So, and yeah. what a huge success that show would go on to be. Yeah, and we had I mean, no idea, dude. We we, we it didn't hadn't even been recorded, right? Hadn't been recorded yet. No, and we didn't even get the we didn't even know our song was the theme song until the week before the show came out. Like they they were trying to get all these other people to do the theme, you know, like and but the the Kurt Sutter really liked our song, but Fox was trying to get like a bigger name and you know and but eventually they were like well this is the best song so wow i remember vividly watching every single episode every week and following that storyline and then i just you know learned this i'm like wait what 
I've, who doesn't know that song, right? You hear that, yeah. you know exactly what it is. So it's just like, yeah, again, I mean, jackpot, huge. you scored. It was huge. Right? Yeah, it was like, you know, that happened. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, you guys got nominated for an Emmy, you know? And I was like, what? And, you know, I had a, and that's really how I made the transition, you know? Then, I, I mean, I didn't really know how to do score, you know, underscore and all that stuff. And, and uh, you know, I, oh, I got a bail soon. I got like 15 minutes. But, oh, okay. you know, I, I, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I got very lucky and I did that. And then, you know, from there, that guy, Bob, uh, went on to do this show called Detroit 187, which was a cop show on ABC. And me and my friend at the time, he asked if we, he thought we would want to do it. And we said yes, and we submitted some stuff. And then on that show is where I really learned how to do score, like, you know, actual underscore, not just writing short songs which it was great like i've done that you know a number of times afterwards and and theme songs are awesome because it's like you don't have to think about how do i make the second verse different than the first verse how do i make this chorus bigger and what's the bridge going to be and what's the outro going to be and what do i have to add to it you know it's just like verse chorus or one awesome part and that's it and right uh, that's all you're gonna hear yeah. right yeah a couple of seconds so um but yeah, it, and it was, you know, I've been talking to, um, you know, like, I've been talking to Marty Schwartz lately about doing, um, kind of partnering with him. And, and I've been, you know, thinking about, or I've been, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do, I'm doing this uh, masterclass thing with, you know, the to do stuff about playing guitar, but also to, you know, how to make that transition as like a band guy, someone who didn't go to school for composing to do composing. Like, cause there's, you know, just even the terminology, you know, the, the, the terminology I didn't know at all. You know, I didn't know right. what a cue was or, you know, having a spotting session or working with a, with a, with a director or a producer, you know, and, and how to do a spotting session and how to, you know, where the scene starts and where it ends and where you want the music and what's the temp music and you know, all this different stuff. And, and even the mindset of writing to picture is totally different, you know, than writing a song, you know, right. because you're serving something that's already there and you're typically, you know, you're, you're, right. you're trying to get, uh, you're part of a team that's trying to, you know, um, make the the watcher the viewer feel something you know and and there's a whole like there's so much to learn about it you know and and you know i'm, I'm still right. feel like a novice but you know just there's just so much you know well what do you say is your favorite piece in a in a cinematic picture that you think they did a great job where they cast the artist, it was a great piece to put in that particular moment, in that scene. And when you think of, you know, movie soundtracks, that's the first thing that comes to mind in that scene in that movie. What would that be? Oh, I don't know, dude. I got mine right here, so you gotta have something. You do? You gotta oh, have something. Shit. Um, I don't know, and it, it's weird because a lot of it isn't score. It's more like like you know needle drops like song placements in movies you know i True. think that's like there's this movie that movie crooklyn the spike lee okay. movie you know where like the mom the mom dies and it's like delroy lindo's like trying to get his daughter ready for the the funeral and it, there's that song by the i think it's a five five stair steps or stair tops or something like that they it's that that song ooh child you know like ooh, okay ooh, child things are gonna get easier you know and 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 then there there's this isaac hayes song in dead presidents too where it's like uh that's another that's another thing but as far as like actual score i can't i can't think well, of anything off Dom, of anyhow so well, we're gonna wrap up here a little bit i gotta ask you kind of tying it up massive success with sons of anarchy then December 2015, we get horrible news. Scott Weiland has passed away. Yeah. 
do you remember where you were at, what you were doing when a, when an event like that takes place? Um, yeah, I remember I was in my house where this all is, and I remember um, yeah, I remember well because Joey Castillo was on was playing drums with them and was on tour with them. And right. I remember right. being in the other room and Duff calling me and telling me. And then I remember calling Joey and I couldn't get in touch with him. And then I talked to him the next morning and he was like, dude, I, I was going to call you. But, you know, he was like being interviewed by police and, you know, all because him and the tour manager were the ones that because found Scott on the bus because. Scott would do that, like even in our band. Like he, a lot of times, you know, there was two different, but like with our band at one point, most of the time we had two different buses, but he would, his thing was always like, he would take the back lounge and set it up like a, with a bed, you know, and make it like a little bedroom instead of sleeping in a bunk. So I think that's where he was on the bus when he passed away and the, I think the tour manager like, you know, went to check on him just to say like, you know, the why I think, I think Scott's wife was calling the tour manager. Like Scott's not answering the phone. I can't get in touch with them. And then they, they went on the bus and I, and that dude and Joey were supposed to go, I think they were going to eat or something. So then he called Joey and was like, dude, you know, you got to get down here. And I think that's, and then I think they found him and then, that's yeah that's what i heard happen did that was that was that shocking to you or did you kind of back your head think uh, and i don't know if i you know i mean you know can... honestly it's it's tragic i mean it's a bummer period but mm. was it unexpected no right no it, it's true and i and, and just recently to end this off i know that um duff mckagan did an interview with uh metal hammer magazine and he was actually asked about, um, you know, the idea of, well, looking back at Bell Revolver, I'll just read right back to you. He said that we took Bell Revolver around the world, but there were things in the band that we just couldn't get around. And I remember those days fondly, but I don't think we'll ever come back together with Scott gone. What's some of your, you know, responses to that in the sense of maybe we know some of like what would you say some of those things could have possibly been some issues there or could you see Bell Revolver ever coming back without Scott but somebody else um, that's not trying to be Scott but maybe does their own flair in these songs I mean what's your view on that as a member of Velvet Revolver I mean uh, you know I I it, it would be I think it would be fun to explore you know, because I love playing with those guys and to have, you know, we, we've done it with uh, different guys, you know, when we tried out different guys or we worked with guys for a minute, you know, or we we even had uh, Frankie Perez in the band for, you know, a, a, a minute and he and I went on to become really good friends. And and um, so playing those songs with other people I've experienced and it's great. It's fun. You know, it's like it's pretty awesome. So I would, you know, speaking for myself, I would be totally up for, you know, investigating it. But at the same time, you know, I understand. Um, but look, to, you know, it's like things get blown up out of proportion and taken out of context and all that kind of stuff all the time. So, you know, I, it's, and I'm just, say whatever I'm thinking so probably should get better at editing myself and be more no, tactful no, it, you know what I mean like but but I mean I think it'd be more than awesome to play with those guys again because I've played with them since you know in different iterations and I love those guys you know so you know I'd be up for it and and it would lo I'd love to see I just love to play you know, the, to play some songs with those guys would be super fun. And, and, um, but, you know, who knows? We'll, we'll, well if you had, to, if you had to think of a player, of a singer, is there anyone that would immediately come to mind? Just again, if you were investigating 
throw in their 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 their, their name in a hat because I no. I got someone in my head right now I'm not that would say actually anyone. okay. That I'm, I'm not gonna I'm say gonna anyone because this. just because I know, dude. Like, like I did this interview last you know a couple weeks ago and it was like. Yeah, I was just talking, the guy was like, oh, do you get nervous on stage? And I'm like, oh, I get, you know, I, I weirdly typically don't get nervous. And, you know, he's like, what about s something else? And I was like, oh, you know, something about Slash, you know. I saw that interview. Yeah. I saw it. You and know then why? I was like, yep. and then I was like, and then I get these Velvet Revolver, like, uh, Google alerts. And it's like, Slash gets super nervous on stage, you know, and I'm like, oh, great. You know, and it's like, it. it could have been it's one terrible. time that he said it to me, and I'm like, dude. So well, You know what it is, too? Do you understand? These publications will literally scan through an interview with someone just looking for something that can be very clickbaity yeah. and can be twisted to put on their headline. Because they won't cover – like, usually won't cover the nice stuff. Yeah. They go for the kind of juicy stuff that could be squeezed. Yeah, which I get. But that's also why I'm – like, even just when you asked that question, I was like, oh, maybe I totally this is get where it. I should die. Like, so it's not like, Dave – Kushner says that so and so it could be the new singer and blah, blah, blah you know. There it is. No, listen, I I totally get it. So here's what I'm gonna throw out. Yes, I'm gonna throw out go. a name because I, th I think it makes sense. Ready? Go. Miles Kennedy. But let we, me explain. No, no, you don't have to. We 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 actually went out to Miles before Scott, and he yes, was. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Yes, and he was doing. Um, he was doing his old, I think the Mayfield Four was his band. He was doing, but yeah, he we we talked to him, and he turned it down. And then I don't remember what happened after that. I I think that after Scott Slash was already talking to him about doing his thing, and I think Slash really wanted to do his solo thing, you know, at that time. And I had just done sons of anarchy and it was just like we were looking for other singers and it just took a long time and it was just felt like it was kind of no one ever said it but it kind of felt like it was time to like move on but yeah. um you know because it was like yeah so i got i got i got you but but so so now you know my reasoning behind it he was already in the running kind of you guys wanted him to come out to audition and i'm like he's already done so much with slash yeah i feel like it'd be like a real organic fit for the band you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. um but uh all right so I'll, I'll leave it with this how does dave kushner define shred Ooh. how do i define shredding I mean, to me, it's like the kind of shredding that I love the most is like, you know, when I first heard Steve Vai, that flexible record, you know, and it was just like there was so much passion. It like for me, it's just like there's other guys like, you know, like I listen to all those guys, all the shrapnel artists. Like when Wasted Youth made the record, we we made it on shrapnel record like. Or no, it wasn't no Shrapnel Records, but it was at uh, that studio where where they made all the Shrapnel Records up in Katati, California. I remember. And Marty, I remember. Anyways, I but I used to listen to all that, like Greg Howe and, you know, Chris and Pelletieri and like all that stuff. Like I would definitely investigate. I was into Jason all that Becker, stuff. Jason Becker, Richie Kotz and yeah. all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the guys to me that were like, like Paul Gilbert or... You know, Steve Vai, Steve Vai especially was, is one of my all time favorite guitar players. You know, when I heard, like, there was this, I remember there was in Guitar Player Magazine, uh, there was a little, like, floppy disc that you could put on your turntable and listen to it was the song Call It Sleep that he put out later on another record. And it's like, the solo in that is like, I mean, the guy obviously can shred, but there's so much passion in it and so much feeling. Like for me, that's really, it can't just be shredding for the sake of shredding and going fast. It has to have, you know, like the solo in, in, um, electric guy, you know, is Glenn Tipton. Like that's one of my all time favorite solos. Cause it's just like, he's fucking squeezing those notes out of that solo. And it's just, or like Gary Moore, who's like, or, yep. or Eric Gales. Like those are yep. my guys. Like when those guys, guys shred it's another 
there's this extra passion in there that's just really it's not so much about you know the technicality it's like i have to play like this because i need to get my point across instead mm -hmm. of just you know sweeping or doing or frank and bali he was a teacher at the school when i was yeah. going there and and his sweeping stuff was just like next level dude but there was a passion you know, behind it you know and for me it has to have any shredding has to have passion behind it real fucking i mean even ingve you know it's like people like to knock him and you know fury. it's like his but there is a, a fury to it and when that first you know rising force record came out or even i saw him playing steeler with you know at in back wow. in the day and it was like oh my god you know and i remember like buying that first Steeler <laughs> record and like who is this guy you know george lynch tells a similar story he says he saw him in a club in la george yeah. has been at your show he saw him playing he's like oh we got some trouble here this is not yeah <laughs> this is not good. yeah yeah dude <laughs> You know, so I, I I could totally see that. For me, I see all the George like Lynch, Vito dude. Bra it's yeah. same, you know, like I'm, yeah, I'm you know a fan of his. And dude, it's so funny because I was looking at your feed and I saw um, Phil X. You know, a lot of Phil X there, and like tons of feel, tons of feel, dude. Seriously, and and a great personality, obviously, and super funny and everything. Great energy, but there was a like one of his bands. And I heard this song on the radio the other day. And I, I took a screenshot. Like, I was driving in my car and I took a picture of the... Because it was on... Uh, I don't know. It was on Spotify. Because I, I was listening to one song and then more songs came up. And, you know, but it was like... It's a really good song. It's kind of like a punk kind of song, but... he's got He's got a few of those. We, we did a master class with him and he just... He delivered it. Like, I set the whole thing up for him. And we try to make him each very unique to the artist and make it just very engaging for everybody. But we did that, and yeah. he got an actually jam with everybody. So oh, really? we'd be on stage and jam with him. Yes. And, dude, he went for anything. You want to jam Van Halen? He'll do it on the spot like that. I'm like, dude, is he's ready always. All right. So, everybody, I want to I thank again Dave Kushner for being a part of this interview, taking the time aside. We're going to definitely have to do some more of these because, again, your career is just so vast. There's so much to talk about in so little time. So we're going to have to definitely do this again. Dave, where can everybody follow you at? Um, oh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I got that out. No, I'm leaving, we're leaving that in. Wait, hold on. No, there's. I just started doing, uh, when I started the, hold on. Oh, when I, no, when I started uh, doing those posts, you know, and started talking to Marty Schwartz and everything, um, I started the, like, I never had a YouTube channel, you know, so I just started it and I was looking, I was like, Oh, what's the thing? And it's at Dave Kushner music, uh, on, on YouTube and at Dave Kushner on Instagram. And, you know, I did a few things on TikTok, but that's TikTok. So, and I have Dave Kushner, I'm building a website for Dave Kushner.com. Um, but when I, um, you, those, the, all those places will have information on, the upcoming um, masterclass thing and, and I'll be working with Marty. So his, you know, anyone that works with him will know uh, what's happening with that. And um, yeah, that's it. Dude. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. And guys follow us at masters of shred official, Mr. Shred official on Instagram, follow the YouTube channel. If you like this video, you like this content, you like this interview with Dave, definitely subscribe, like share, comment, show us you care means the world to us. Very awesome moment, but thank you for tuning in. Big thank you again to you, Dave, for being a part of this. This was such a blast. I appreciate it. Let me pick your brain. I know I asked you a lot of questions, so I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, you know what? I equally talked a lot, so. <laughs> Which isn't a bad thing for me. That's good. <laughs>